It's December the 12th, 2020. Eight years from now, Britain has left the European Union. At least, that's what increasing numbers of us seem to want. Sometime very soon, David Cameron is going to have to tell us all what he wants our destiny in Europe to be. Will we be allowed a vote on the subject? Latest opinion polls seem to suggest that nearly three quarters of us may want to leave the European Union or to have a different sort of relationship with it. Sometime in the very near future, the Prime Minister is expected to announce that we'll be allowed a vote in a referendum. To these people, our only viable destiny is as part of the European project. To these, we have nothing to lose but our chains. What do you think if we decide to leave? I think it will be a dangerous and cold environment we're in. Prosperity, we will not have inward investors coming into Britain. We won't be able to export too easily. The city will have begun its long slide over to the continent. We will find that we're not part of a regional bloc. The rest of the world is. We're an isolated country and we will be cut off from the source of peace and stability in Europe. And you think it's a sort of promised land, don't you? Well, I think we'll go on doing business with European companies, just as we do now, although it'll be a smaller percentage for two reasons. Firstly, the Eurozone is headed for a disaster. And secondly, freed from the customs union that we're trapped in, we'll be able to negotiate our own trade deals with the rest of the world. The future for Britain should be global, not European. What do you think it'll be like if we decide I, to I'd leave? be worried in 2020. Limited access to 500 million people. Limited access to a 16, 17 trillion dollar economy, a unified single market. Uh, limited access for our exports, for our financial services companies, quite apart from advertising agencies and the like. We'll probably still be renegotiating bilateral trade agreements in 2020, eight years on. And last but not least, we'll probably have a dim diminished political significance. You run uh, a big financial house. Yes. Why do you take a contrary view? Um, I think, if I could put it very simply, if we weren't in, we could actually enjoy the benefits of free trade, which ironically we were supposed to have got from a common market, but we don't with the remainder of the world. There is an assumption here that you just show up in Brussels in a few years' time with a list of demands and you pick and choose, we're going to comply with these EU, EU rules, but not those. That deal is not available because if it was available to Britain, it would have to be available to all other countries and the single market would unravel. So I think there is a choice between in or out. Hello, Hank, now, you're, now you're Norwegian, always outside the EU, but you think even that's too close. Yes, we are in the EEA agreement, which is basically the single market. The European Economic yeah, Area. It's the single market, basically. Uh, um, and we think that that's too much. And uh, what us. do you think? I mean, supposing Britain joined you, which is pr probably the best we could hope for, isn't it? That we'd be in some sort of arrangement whereby we. What, what you do, you're shaking your head. You can explore uh, that later. But no, we're, but we're a big market place for Europe. Yeah. Well, we, yeah. you know, it's worth remembering. We traded a massive deficit with these yeah. countries. It's not no, massive. but I, I think. Right. 45 I think, billion a year. I okay. think in, tw in 2020, Britain will be a member of EFTA, the European Free Trade Association. I, I think that would be a, a good solution. Here's the scenario. In 2015, in a referendum, Britain votes to leave the European Union. Under the Lisbon Treaty, a two-year transition process begins. Our MEPs leave the Parliament and Britain's EU Commissioner stands down. By the summer of 2017, the transition is complete. Britain is out of the single market, the common agricultural policy, the common fisheries policy, the European Court of Justice. Blue flags disappear from Britain's beaches. But what then? It's December the 12th, 2020. Here's the news. The Office for Budget Responsibility today confirmed that for the third year in a row, Britain is growing faster than at any time since the Blair era. GDP growth stood at 4%, but the Chancellor said that inflation remained unacceptably high. Predicting what Britain's future might look like if we left the EU is difficult because there's no authoritative research. But if we did leave and growth picked up, what might have gone right to make that happen? Over a period of time, we would benefit because we could have freer trade with the rest of the world, lower food prices, we could uh, wind down some of the renewables legislation, be lower electricity prices, fewer directives and regulations, more, more small businesses would come back. We wouldn't have all of these problems of, of, of um, people coming from Europe and wanting our welfare benefits and use, to use the NHS. So in all these ways, Britain would benefit. 
Britain is a net importer from the European Union, running a trade deficit with the EU last year. That should make it possible to do a trade deal. One option would be to do what Norway did and remain part of the European economic area. But in this more radical scenario, the UK secures a favourable bilateral trade deal modelled on Switzerland. And it quickly signs new bilateral deals with key markets set to experience high growth. Brazil, China, India and Russia. Some analysts claim European regulations cost business £19 billion a year. In this scenario, these are scrapped. The UK would choose which social legislation it wanted to keep, for example, the Working Time Directive or the Agency Workers Directive, which have been controversial here. In this scenario, agricultural subsidies, £3.8 billion, are phased out, and Britain's £8 billion net transfer to the EU ends. And as free movement of labour in and out of the EU is cancelled, there'd likely be a workforce effect. It might be positive. Unemployment has fallen to a 10-year low. The claimant count was just 700,000 last month as manufacturing employment is rising and as European migrant workers leave. The number of EU citizens living in the UK, which peaked at 2 million in 2012, has halved. Most coffee bars and fast food stores are now 90% staffed by UK nationals. Financial services account for about 10% of our GDP now, but in our future scenario, if things went right for Britain outside Europe, the City of London could benefit as Europe regulates, homogenises, clamps down. London could become effectively an offshore centre, a giant Singapore. The prospects for Britain in the 21st century, as if you like a global nation, not a, not a European focused nation, as a global nation, I think are fabulous. Um, and that's really because the kind of the English speaking world in particular is, I think, going to do extremely well in the 21st century Canada, Australia, America, and so on, India. And we should plug into that. All scenarios are speculative. And this best case scenario, the assumption is globalization continues. That might be over optimistic, but some do dream of a booming city in a booming Britain outside the EU for good. What would Britain feel like outside the EU, Nigel Farage? Well, I think our democracy would be regenerated. It's very interesting. When we have general elections now, we generally debate schools and hospitals because there's no point discussing business regulations because all of those things are now decided by European law and there's almost nothing the British government or parliament can do about these. So we would, we would suddenly have furious debates on how we managed industry, how we dealt with our uh, renewable energy targets. We would be in charge of these things and democracy would benefit. More people would vote in general elections. We'd be in charge of our own house again. It's hard to believe that we'd be more regulated if we're outside, so I think we might feel a bit freer in that regard. If you look at those wonderful things where you look at the, uh, the 246 words in the Gettysburg Address and the 10,000 words on the directive on eggs in the EU, uh, it, it's hard to believe that in business or in life in general that we'd be subject to more regulation, which I don't think people want. And we regulate uh, ourselves more than the Europeans do. We gold plate our le European legislation as it is. Well, we okay. wouldn't have anything to gold plate, would we? You can <laughs> uh, you'll shout in a second or two. Hello, what do you think uh, Britain would be like? Do you be oh, I think it leaders? would be a proud independent nation outside the EU. I mean, we'll be able to, to play a proper role on the world right. scene. I mean, the... I mean, the EU is only, what, 27 countries, and there are 180 countries in the world. Would there really be no regulation in this country? Would people be wanting to work 100 hours a week, no health and safety regulation, okay. no green no energy? No health and safety We're regulation. We have homegrown health and safety Children regulation. Going yes. and, and how would that exactly be different from, from the European rules that are now being worked out between all the well, European countries. We'd have chosen them ourselves instead of letting some other nationality yes. choose them. Then, then yeah. every time you want to export exactly. something to the continent, mm -hmm. it, you have to go through a, a safety certification okay. process because uh, you're, not, you're not going to import anything from Bangladesh that, 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 that isn't true. tested. But that, no, is but the same. True. that is the same if we have to export goods to any other part of the world. We have to conform with their markets. The important thing to remember is this. You know, that, those figures, Paul Mason's figures, were wrong. Half our trade is not with Europe. Because of, the, because of the Rotterdam effect, if we transship stuff, that shows as European trade. The true that's, figure is 38%. Now, I'm not suggesting that 38% of our overseas market isn't important. It is important, but it's a declining part 
of our overseas business. The Eurozone is contracting large parts of the, the European moment. economy, and we it's find gonna, ourselves, as the sixth biggest Nigel. economy in the world, forbidden from Europe's forbidden not continue from making, not, not contracting. Well, I think it's headed forever. for the well, I think it's headed for catastrophe with the eurozone. Nothing lasts forever. There, there could be a dramatic bust in the eurozone in the next five years, and you can't discount that. But, but what is for certain is that there are markets out there that are going to grow in the next yes, few years, I and agree. we are forbidden I agree. from having right. bilateral and we trade. Have more I, I, um, if we rid ourselves in this country of this great bogeyman of the European Union, what do you think it would do to us? Uh, everybody, I mean, everybody knows basically that essentially what happens uh, economically. Is, is sometimes very little to, to do with um, membership of these kind of institutions. I mean, you, c you can be Greece or you can be Iceland. It doesn't really make it that, that much odds. <coughs> it's, it's all about what happens in the global economy. All right. When he says that big business of the kind that you two represent mm -hmm. sold as a pup on Europe, he's right, isn't he? I don't think so. Why, why do they keep complaining about regulation then? Well, because so. because I mean, businessmen always one. complain about regulation, and they'll really? complain about regulation if Britain has sole control of it. No, but it's, it is true that we do. There is excessive regulation. No, 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 excessive regulation. It is true that there is uh, Thank you, a, a negative result of that. But the, the ability to deal with it inside the it, it's nonsense no, 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 to suggest that it's to not. be inside the tent. To be inside the tent. Terry is the way to go, not to be outside the tent. It's, well, it's to be inside, arguing your case, you've got, instead of being you've got, on the outside. You've got, you've got a greater faith in our ability to influence well, people than I have. Got, Does it work for you, the European Union? No, it's a bit clunky. I mean, I have to come back on the point about it being successful for, for smaller companies. You know, us expanding into Europe. How big's your company? Uh, we employ about 350 people in about five or six countries. Yeah. And this year we've launched in Tel Aviv and in Toulouse. And it was just as difficult in both territories. And there's something very wrong about that. People watching this might think I'm moaning about some form filling. This has some teeth. And you get it wrong and you get fined. And, and also, that is not a single market. going in this direction is the least painful bit. Try firing people in France if you're yeah. in business. I've operated three businesses in France. And every time I've ever suggested any kind of downsizing, my finance director has turned pale on me. Yeah. Um, I mean, there is just simply a completely different set of labour laws which are operating over there, which are clearly not business positive. I, I think when you talk about uh, working class people, I mean, one of the biggest concerns out there right now is jobs. Um, and whilst free movement of peoples worked when we had northern European countries in the European Union, to have extended our borders to the whole of Eastern Europe, as we've done since 2004, has meant a massive oversupply in the unskilled labour market in this country and as a result many working families have got members of their households unemployed that otherwise would not be if we hadn't gone down okay, this road. Okay, the call a spade a spade, withdrawal means an end to Eastern European immigration. It means, an, it means an end to a total open door to Eastern Europe, yes. And that means an end to all the people who come into this country and give vi uh, vitality to our creative industries, no, to our financial services, no, 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 to our no, we use work permits. We use work permits. What we do not have is a total open door. Oh, uh, and we've had, right. we've had basis, massive oversupply that basis, in the unskilled labour market, and that is an ir irresponsible and, 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 and 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 my market, but then you What I do know is, on, is, is that on the 1st of January 2014, we are opening our doors and our social security system and our health service up to 29 million people from Romania and Bulgaria, and I think that's a mistake and not in the interests of working families in this country. Jeremy. One of the arguments is that by being within the European Union, this country <coughs> it makes itself open to all sorts of inward investment from Asian and other countries, emerging economies in Brazil and Russia, India and China, and it also because people like the idea of access to the to the single market is that true no uh, i think i hear all these politicians big business talking about um the european union britain uh, as if uh, the businesses don't matter uh, not a single mention has been made about what it is that underlies the business that people want to do whether it's a uh, trade or whether it's investment whether it's the product or the services I mean, Germany does very good because the Mercedes-Benz car is damn good. If Britain made good things and provide good services, China would buy it and China would invest in it. I mean, already China uh, does quite well with uh, Britain. Uh, it, it has, for example, on the long London Stock Exchange, uh, I think eight uh, listed companies worth about 16 billion, 43 smaller 
project companies on AIM worth about three and a half billion. And people underestimate the language. 300 million people in China are learning English. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also, yeah. they have a history through Hong Kong, which mm -hmm. is That's possibly right. one of the greatest um, uh, free zones as far as uh, the free this market is concerned point, yeah. about oh, how China is going to yeah. get yeah. out yeah. and I think Britain should do much more in, in, I think in Hong Kong. Point. Do you think point. Chinese companies uh, And let me just say one more thing. Uh, the, 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 the question whether UK is in or out of Europe I think is very going to be very low on the agenda for any That's business. That's precisely what I was going to ask you. Well, do I they care? what you were going to ask me. Do they care? <laughs> no, they don't. They don't, because so what they care well, is well, whether they can sell their services. Yeah. The euro, the Chinese regard as extremely dangerous because they simply don't understand or can predict where it's going to go. The sterling is not uh, as great a currency, perhaps, but there is much more certainty. Mm. And already, the British government is doing quite a lot in terms of trying to help the renminbi to become convertible the more Chinese than anybody currency, else. Yeah. Yes. And so and actually Britain is doing quite well. And so the question yeah. whether it's in and out yeah. for me is irrelevant. Um, hang on, the Norwegian experience, mm -hmm. how much do you suffer from being outside the European Union? I don't think we suffer at all, to be honest. They've also got fish in Norway, and we've given away an industry that on its own <laughs> we've got the fish would be worth three, three, three billion British pounds a year of what is caught in British waters, is given away, is given away there are to all the other no fish so I, I think we, we manage very well outside the European Union. Uh, mm. We have a, an oil-based economy, that is true, but we, the revenue from, from the oil is transferred else. into yeah. the Norwegian society. That's a political choice and, and we have pay, made. But is it not uh, also true that you have to abide by European regulations? Isn't that true? Yeah, that's in order because, to, that's to get access to the single market? That is true, isn't that's it? That's true, yeah, because we are... You're essentially EU. governed by facts from Brussels. No, we are not governed by facts by, uh, from Brussels. <laughs> we have in, uh, <laughs> no, because the EA agreement, the European... Um, the single market agreement uh, has a clause where we can actually veto a, a directive if we don't, we don't like it, and we have done that. There's an important connection between two people here. One of the things that I think makes Norway and Hong Kong, funnily enough, a success, if you look, a number of people run things called the Economic Freedom Index, where they look at things like taxation and regulation to see how easy it is to do business. Yes. And if you look at that, in the top ten countries mm -hmm. in the world, you regularly get Norway and Hong Kong and Singapore and Chile and so on. Have scale, a look. Okay. Have a look. No, scale it's, is it's, totally uh, different. Uh, uh, it's, it's totally nothing, different. It's nothing to do 60 with scale. Million versus it's 5 million. America Much comes easier. in the top 10. America That's comes not in the to top take 10. anything away from Singapore, but, right. but it, it America is done comes on a in the very top small 10, scale. Not in, what are you saying? It's, but there's one that's becoming, okay. it's there's becoming increasing. The, the, the European Union is becoming increasingly right. come way down it. The percentage of our overseas trade that is done with Europe, I repeat, is 38% and falling every single year. All right, okay. All the people who are pro-Europe, I think, would uh, be very, very reluctant to see us to see us leave uh, altogether. So well, I think it doesn't mean it won't think, happen. It doesn't. I think I think what needs to happen now is that we need to have a new relationship with with the the EU. And the, what people will say before you put this to me, so I know this is what the objection will be. They'll say this is not on the table. Our partners will never allow this. They will never accept this kind of, of renegotiation. So I, I just want to show you, illustrate why I think it is deliverable. Well, first Not of all, you better more. tell us what it is you think our relationship should be. Well, as I say, what it should be is a relationship where we shear off a lot of the excrescences that have, you know, I don't see any particular need for us to be, for instance, in the common fisheries policy. I don't see why uh, we have the, the social chapter affecting uh, bits of em employment law that aren't really, strictly speaking, Are you happy for us to be in the common agricultural policy? And I think that should be wholly with... So we could not, only stay within the EU if we left the common agricultural policy? I think that the CAP, as it's currently constituted, is probably indefensible anyway. So we would... Uh, the question would be either out or staying within the EU, but not part of the common agricultural policy, the common fisheries policy, and one or two other things. That's right. Right. Um, so, so it would be it would be membership of an outer tier. And do you think David Cameron can deliver such a thing—a relationship where we are within the European Union, but not part of the Common Agricultural Policy, the Common Fisheries Policy, and the other bits and pieces? I do. You do. 
And, and let me Shouldn't just tell you how... Shouldn't he tell us what his basic minimum is then? I'm, I'm sure he's going to reveal all. The, 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 he's got some great speech about this coming up. So give us, give us a new relationship. You stop blaming us for being the backmarkers. We stop moaning uh, and we have a new treaty. Uh, now, Emma Reynolds is the shadow uh, Europe minister for the Labour Party. Um, will the Labour Party give the British people a referendum on in or out? Well, we don't think it's the right time now to hold a referendum. We think that would be a distraction. No, no the economy. we do it tomorrow. I think it will depend what happens with the rest of the European Union. The Eurozone is going to integrate more closely. It remains to be seen right. what the relationship between those who are outside of the Eurozone and those within the Eurozone well, is going to be. You heard Boris Johnson say there were various specific things that he thought a Conservative government would wish to renegotiate with the rest of Europe, agriculture, fisheries and so on. What would you like to renegotiate? Well, certainly we would like to see a reform of the Common Agricultural Policy. You wouldn't policy. Re like to renegotiate well, I, anything? Well, let me say, I think what he is proposing is totally unrealistic. No, no, in I, order to I, withdraw I'm not interested power, in what you think of his policies. I'm interested in what your policies are. Well, in government we said we wanted to look at renegotiating structural funds. European yeah. regional policy. But I certainly don't think that we want to um, repatriate things like employment and social legislation. Mm. We don't want to repatriate other parts of the... You don't um, want to reclaim internal... British fisheries or stop subsidising French farmers? You don't want to do any of that? Well, I mean, we also uh, get money back from the CAP, although we would like to see a reform of the CAP. We would like to see less money mm. go on the CAP. I think there's cross-party agreement on that. But we, I, mean, I think it's worth saying, Jeremy, that in order to repatriate power, you would need the agreement of 26 other member states. So David Cameron can't do it, it's just posturing? Well, I think Boris Johnson is certainly posturing it. Well, we'll see what David Cameron comes up with. I mean, his speech has been postponed three or four times, so we'll see what he says. Where do you think we're going to end up after another three or four years, Nigel Farage? <coughs> I think that the shift in public opinion and in business opinion in this country is so fundamental and so great uh, that we're seeing uh, big changes in politics. Um, I think that uh, Cameron, whether he likes it or not, is going to be forced into offering a referendum. I think he will do everything he can to avoid an in-out referendum, but he'll make a referendum promise. Labour, uh, within a couple of days, will match that promise. Uh, so I think a referendum is coming, and I think in 2016 there will be a referendum in this country. Whether, Jeremy, that ends it or not, I don't know, but I think inevitably the 17 Eurozone countries are moving towards a full okay. political union. We cannot go on that journey. So our relationship is going to change fundamentally. Yep. Whether it's as much as I want it to be in a few years' time, I don't know, but in the end, right. that's where we're going. You